Yeah, I think this is a very timely opportunity, actually, to talk about the multiple regulatory environment, which is what I will do uh, for the next few minutes and share with you some thoughts. Um, if you just allow me one second to get my papers together. The reason I need to get my papers together is the Alternatives Directive, uh, anybody in the audience who's familiar with this, has got a lot of uh, complicated moving parts, so I want to make sure I get this right. Okay, so here we go. Now, hopefully this isn't a sight test for too many people. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right, so regulation. Uh, it used to be so simple, by the way, in terms of my background. Um, so I had up uh, regulatory reform for Ernst & Young, and um, I've been at the company for six years, but I have a background in the industry. Uh, before that, um, I used to be in trading and then operations for about 20 odd years. I worked around uh, various parts of the globe. I worked here in Brussels, for example, at Swift. I've also worked in the United States at Merrill Lynch and Instanet. I've worked in Germany at Deutsche Börse. So uh, what I'll be uh, composing for you is, if you like, a, a, reg a regulatory picture, but having come from the trading side and the operations side in the industry as well. Anyway, uh, we asked for regulations. We had a financial crisis, and now we have so many regulations. We have about 40 alone in the uh, European Union. And um, this is paralleled with regulatory initiatives around the world. So what I'm going to do is to try and give you a top-down picture and then make it relevant for real estate uh, as we uh, get into the detail of the Alternative Directive, the AFMD, Alternative Inv Investment Management uh, uh, Funds Directive. Um, Firstly, regulation used to be show me the rule. Then it used to be um, provide me with the evidence. Now it's all about transparency, investor protection, and value. So therefore, there's a huge focus on the part of the authorities, the commission here in Europe, or the council, or the parliamentarians, uh, to focus on what is the right outcome for the end investor. And if the end investor is any of us in the room, uh, as buyers of property, for example, or anybody who's managing, for instance, um, a local authority fund or anybody who has need for a property portfolio, uh, making sure that you have the right transparency in a market uh, such as the, well, the uh, property market is a, is a pretty, co pretty critical undertaking. And it's quite complicated because of the number of regulations that are at work, um, which have different legal powers. So at the moment, if you look on the left-hand side towards the United States, uh, since the crisis, uh, since 2009 actually, uh, the US have pursued at a very high velocity uh, their Dodd-Frank legislation, which is not prescriptive on the property industry uh, as such, but it is very much driven in favor of Wall Street reform and investor protection. Those are the two components of the Dodd-Frank measures. So reform of the financial markets post the crisis of 2007 and protection for the investor, both of the consumer and institutional investor perspective. And the thing about the United States regulations is they apply to all U.S. persons. So if you have, for example, anybody in your, um, in your portfolio who's identified, for example, as being a U.S. person as defined by the SEC, the Securities Exchange Commission, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, the uh, Internal Revenue Service, uh, then you have to perform uh, as if you are accounting to the United States. Okay. Now that means that for us sitting in, here in Europe, we have to identify who within our portfolio is a U.S. person. And that's why we start with the U.S. at the, at, at the, at the left-hand side. Um, because as we've seen with the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, FATCA, it's really important um, uh, you know, to, to pay attention to where the Americans are going with their regulatory uh, regimes. Here in Europe, we also have our own nuances. Banking Union is the dominant force at this point in time. And it's partly driven by Basel III, but it's also driven by macroeconomic uh, issues, which are very fundamental, as we've seen in Greece and more recently in Cyprus. Uh, there's a huge focus around stability, financial stability, such as recovery resolution planning, sometimes called li living wills. And in the middle of the chart at the top there, 12 o'clock, you can see that there are a variety of European measures. And then we have uh, measures which um, are also specific uh, to, uh, to Europe, which are not paralleled uh, in, the, in the United States or other regions of the world. So at 12 o'clock, you see the measures which are common, as I call global measures, but on the top right, 1 o'clock, 1.30, you can see also that there are the components which we have in Europe, like the Payment Services Directive, and also the Markets and Financial Instruments Directive, the revision to that, and also the Alternatives Directive and USITS. All of those measures are for the European markets. 
I'm not going to go into Asia Pacific, but sooner or later, if you're in Singapore, if you're in Hong Kong, Australia, you're going to have to look at the Americas and look at Europe and take your pick. So it's, it's very likely that we are going to see uh, regulation not just uh, focusing on the West or where we are now, but also on the East as well. This really is a sight test, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, take away some pictures. The cost of this in Europe alone is about 25 to 30 billion of transformational change, okay? If you had to go dig up the road regulation by regulation by regulation, that's what the industry would have to pay. And I'm talking about banking, talking about asset management and insurance. If, on the other hand, we recognize that there are commonalities between different regulations. Now, I mentioned some of these, like, for instance, uh, Basel or Alternatives Directive or MIFID. If there are commonalities between the measures, for example, common governance, common policies, procedures, common systems controls, common management information, and especially common data, yeah, then it becomes a lot easier to try and automate the industry to prepare for more regulations to come because that is the story of the next decade. Regulations are not going to turn off. They're going to ramp up because there's a call for even more transparency, more investor protection, more political um, uh, intermediation. It's probably the nice, polite way of saying it. But in, in effect, uh, politicians have a huge part to play, and we, as investors, also have a part to play in this uh, industry. And it means that the wealth industry and the asset management industry in general uh, has to reshape itself. No longer can the asset management or the wealth industries or the property industries say, look, we are in the market, but we're not of the market. That, those days are gone. Okay? The new regulation to come will focus very much on what is an asset manager, what is an insurer, what are they doing, much more than just what is a bank or what's the central clearinghouse doing. Okay? So it will extend its tentacles. And as a result, finding what is common to each of these measures. So, for example, real estate values, valuations, and how frequently you carry them out. This becomes a critical issue, not just because you want the convenience of knowing, okay, here's my position, but also because you need to evidence this to somebody else. Sometimes a regulator, but sometimes the end investor. Um, the other reason it's important is because, as, uh, as human beings, we can only pay attention to so many different changes at the same time some of which are direct regulations, meaning they have single legal effect in every member state, every one of the 27 member states, and some of which are directives, which means they are transposed into, law, into local law. So English common law, Code Napoleon, etc. Yeah? And unfortunately, what we call regulations are usually a combination of both of these facets. Um, a lot of people will tend to think, well, just show me the rule. That's changed, you see, because every country will have its own legal system. And the near you, nearer you are to get to uh, an actual end investor or a retail buyer, then they, the laws of um, conduct, they called, uh, are going to change. So it means that uh, even if you're not in the regulation field, you will know that those of your colleagues who are paying attention to regulation and risk management are going to be very busy for the next three to five years because what will happen is an awful lot of things are going to come together. For example, financial transaction tax is a really important uh, set of measures which are going to be applied to the cash markets, the derivative markets, potentially the repo markets. It could affect corporates, it could affect pension funds, and it's, there's a, uh, there are 11 member states which are probably going to roll out these measures on an enhanced cooperation basis. And something will happen. It's not like this is just going to be voted into oblivion. There will be a form of FTT. In fact, there already is in France and Italy, as, uh, France as of August last year and Italy as in March this year. So the question is, for you sitting in the audience, how are you going to manage the complexities of these sorts of timelines all coming together and other complicating factors like FTT and FATCA, a European FATCA that's also being talked about? This is not going to get any simpler anytime soon unless we can do a lot of work together and we can see the commonalities. Yeah? And by the way, having worked at SWIFT here in Brussels, we spend a lot of time trying to devise standards. The industry needs standards. That includes the property industry, needs standards. For a long time, if I can be so bold, and when I worked in asset management, we used to look at equities, fixed income, multi-asset, multi-strategy, and property was always held, you know, it was always held uh, by itself. Everybody sort of said, well, you can't treat that asset class the way you can treat the others. They're not as liquid, and they have more complications about risk management. The regulators don't understand that, and the politicians certainly don't understand that. Times have changed. They're expecting this market to become transparent, become much more accountable. That means net asset valuations have to be evidenceable. 
So it's not just asset managers who have to prepare for this cloud, it's also the parties that serve the asset management space as well, sometimes custodian banks, sometimes vendors, etc. So, so far I hope I haven't depressed you for <laughs> Wednesday morning, okay? There are things you can do about a complex space like this. The first thing to do is to admit to being human. There'll be things we know, things that are written down and will happen, okay? You can plan around those. You can actually instruct a program management team to actually get on with coding, get on with reporting, uh, get on with valuation techniques, etc., etc. In fact, all the components that you need to do under the alternatives directive. In fact, show of hands, how many people have read AFMD? Ah, oh, <laughs> you really have my sympathies. <laughs> it depends when you started reading it as well. Do you start reading it all the way back in 2009? Because... Uh, <laughs> I, I, I wish I hadn't, because <laughs> I, have I have a picture which I didn't dare make a slide of. But uh, it actually shows to what extent this horrible directive has changed over time with regards to all its pieces. But, um, yeah, I mean, there are lot of, lots of pieces in, in, in the alternatives directive, like remuneration, like asset stripping, which were not apparent in the initial text. So if you went ahead and you coded systems and you thought, oh, yeah, what's published on the 30th of April 2009 is the final measure, okay, you would have lost some money. It would, have, it would be opportunity cost for you to implement what you see published. So this di diagram is divided into two pieces, stuff we know at the top and also uh, stuff we don't know, stuff we have to scenario model, stuff where you have to check your peer group, and uh, stuff where you basically have to say, I think the direction of travel is probably going to end up about here. Okay? So when it comes to the alternative directive, what do we know and what do we not know? Well, with the alternative directive, I'm sure some of you will be aware of some of the component parts. Common regulatory framework for anybody who's not aware. It's covering all instruments which are non-usets. So therefore, it's a very broad church. It'll include hedge funds, investment trusts, private e equity. Uh, obviously, uh, real estate is covered by this. Commodity funds, infrastructure funds, non-usets retail funds like NERS. Uh, it's anything but usets. Okay? It's about reducing systemic risk and ensuring investor protection. In fact, you can almost say that's true of every regulation nowadays, by the way. Uh, if you want to show that you're an expert in regulation, you can say to a politician, it's about reducing systemic risk and ensuring investor protection. And then nod the head, because that's what they're told as well. <laughs> but it has a lot of moving parts. Uh, it features remuneration, and remuneration is a very serious issue. But just ask any hedge fund. It's about liquidity management, and therefore very relevant to the real estate industry. It's about valuations, it's about delegation, so who does what, basically, and who's acting on your behalf. It's about risk management, of course. It's also about things like depository liability, which may not affect the asset managers in this room, but certainly will affect custodian banks who have to manage your assets. Depository liability, basically, is an anti-Madoff prevention mechanism, if I can be so simplistic. It's about reporting, and it's about other measures as well. Third country marketing is one of the most important measures there. So lots of moving parts, some of which are known, some of which are not known. We don't know what depository liability will cost us in the real estate market. If anybody in the audience disagrees, please tell me, because I'd love to know. How much of an uplift is it going to be for us asset managers in the room? Then um, also, if you, if, so if you know, you can implement. And if you don't know, you just have to ask around. And that's what I do for a living, by the way. I conduct surveys for Ernst & Young, and I ask asset managers almost every month, what are you doing in risk? What are you doing in operations? What are you doing in regulation? So what are the high uh, priority and what are the high impact items from one month to the next? That's what I do for a living. So these are some of the sorts of things we've got to take into account. Now, remuneration I mentioned briefly. It is one of the most politically sensitive because of the possibility of the bonus cap. This will apply to code staff. This will also apply possibly to senior management as well. And I think if, if, I, if I can counsel you to want to comply with this set of measures, I think having an understanding and evidencing to a regulator, uh, here's how we treat our governance, and here's how we embed our principles, these are really important things to, to be re able to respond to to your regulator because they will ask you. They will want to know that your senior management understand what this directive means in practice. So, when does this take effect? Officially takes effect from the 22nd of uh, July this year, and then you're allowed uh, one year of transition, particularly around the liability case. So everybody in real estate is impacted by this measure. Okay? So this is why I'm focusing on it, on, on it this morning. And what you see here, 
will actually affect the usage market in probably about the next two years as well. So no escape. It's not like you can define yourself not to be alternative and suddenly go back into usage, because usage 5 will take care of that for you. Now, what do we mean by prepare? So I, I, there's a diagram there that showed a few, uh, th few things you can do. By the way, you can do them free. You don't need consultants or anybody else to do this. You can ask industry associations. You can ask each every one of you in the room, what are you doing about these measures? In fact, what we tend to do is organize events all the time, breakfasts, dinners, etc. And they're just peers, and they're just talking about issues. Like, this is the top priority for this week. Yeah? Uh, you identify overlaps. This is called an impact analysis in fancy consulting speak. And then finally, um, you basically adapt your systems. Now, that sounds very, very simple. That's the hard bit. How do you adapt your systems with regulations in mind, plural? What we see most firms doing is two mistakes. One is they don't put somebody on the bridge looking at all the regulations, all of this. Yeah? They don't see that. They see regulation by regulation. I call that digging up the road. You dig it on one day for the gas. You dig it the next day for the electrics the next day for some repairs, maybe. It's very expensive. It's very inconvenient. It's also not very clever, because if regulations will never go away, you're going to be doing a lot of digging. In fact, that becomes your whole modus operandi. Yeah, that's not a great way to run a business. So a clever way to run your business is to try and figure out what are the overlaps. And then it gets to the point where, what do you do about these overlaps? What do you do about regulations when you can be completely compliant, but out of business? Yeah, that's a very real business question. It's probably the question at the moment. Firms are looking at the financial transaction tax. Let's say you own money market funds. And you're sort of thinking to myself, uh, if I was completely compliant with these measures, there might be no liquidity in these funds. Okay? It might disappear completely. If I throw, for instance, use its five plus shadow banking, all these future measures. So we say to companies, avoid the first mistake. Put somebody on the bridge so you can see all the regulations, not just reg by reg. Don't just give AFMD to one person and USITS to another and MIFID to, to come to a third person. Make sure there's a common governance and a common approach. The second thing is firms also need to look at the totality of the standards that they use. They need to safeguard their data. And a lot of firms don't do that. They regard data as something to worry about at the very end of the day. But in fact, data is critical. And in the world of multiple regulations, data will be the means of competition. That will be the only means where you can keep your cost-income ratios down and actually maximize your innovation. So we encourage firms to think holistically, not just about impact, but also about opportunity. So the two things, once again, don't make the mistake of not putting somebody on the bridge to watch for future regulations. Secondly, guard that data. So what does it mean for the alternatives directive? I mentioned the high level. Um, there's some components that you can take away if you uh, want to see this chart. But effectively, like many regulations, this is about a few fundamental things. Remember I said it's investor protection, but also uh, financial stability. So things like authorization are really important and capital requirements. Almost every regulation that you will see, MIFID, IMD2, Market Abuse Directive 2, will all have this structure. There'll be something around guard your capital, make sure you've got enough capital, and make sure you're authorized to do the things you say you're going to do. There'll be something around EU versus non-EU. It's just the way things are. The fact the Americans have got Dodd-Frank means we have to cope with not one regulatory environment, but several. The US, the European regional, our own national country measures, okay, that's a lot of complexity. Okay? That's what that second segment. Uh, and when it comes to information to clients, for example, about the property industry, making sure you are not mis-selling, this is a really, really important issue. So the new risks. Legal, liquidity, multi-layer risk, financial risks in the property markets are the sorts of things that worry asset managers. And I talk to managers like Aviva or Henderson's, etc., uh, in this all the time. They all say the same thing. Manage those risks. And the risks are partly in terms of uh, the marketing side. Then there's conduct of business. And this is a conduct risk. Uh, and the failure to manage conduct of business means you will be fined a lot of money by certain regulators. The UK regulator, which is now the FCA, for instance, on the conduct side, it hasn't got a C for nothing in its name. Financial Conduct Agency, huge focus on conduct, doing the right things by the client or avoiding client detriment. These are the core directions of travel that we're going to see. And we're going to see it in the France with the AMF. We're seeing it in Italy already with the CONSOB. This is not just a UK phenomenon. We're going to see it in various markets in Europe, much more focus on conduct. In fact, the new measures like PRIPS, the Package Retail Investment Products measures, uh, will reinforce that. Then you've got functions and service providers. 
you can't exist in a vacuum. This is now a much more holistic uh, space. So if you're an asset manager or an end investor, you have to rely on working in partnership with your bank. Your bank is actually investing a great deal in your, their middle office and uh, back office outsourcing uh, provision functions, for example, to help asset managers. So uh, a good deal of uh, the, the narrative has to be around collaboration. And collaboration is really important when it comes to things like valuations, for example. So quality, timeliness, accuracy, repeatability of those valuations, really key. Sometimes they're called NAVs. Um, risk and liquidity management. You know, you increasingly need to find uh, who, who is your party that is actually carrying this out in the event that you don't do it all yourself. Otherwise, if you're a manager of the assets, then you're going to find that uh, the costs to do it are uh, extraordinarily high. Yeah? The cost to comply with every one of those regulatory measures is, is too high for most managers, unless you're BlackRock or somebody like that. So um, you're going to have to depend on somebody else. And the regulators are really focused on this issue, this dependency. It's called outsourcing. Uh, in the UK, for instance, there's a special thematic review on asset managers right now asking managers to kick the tires for the banks. Have you seen their service level agreements? What are they like under stress conditions? Uh, have you seen their living will uh, arrangements? All that kind of thing. In other words, the managers are getting the questions as well as the banks. So at six o'clock, uh, the functions and service provider shows we're in a holistic um, ecosystem there. Then there's tr transparency. So often, if you're in this industry, you're going to have to report more not just to the regulator, but also to your end clients. And that's the other thing I haven't really mentioned, how end client investors are really inflating their expectations. They're expecting more timely, more accurate, more value-added reporting. And if you look at a lot of the cost, we typically see 30% of the cost for managers is in the reporting area because they're having to up the frequency and the accuracy uh, of the reports which they have to carry out. And lastly, there are specific provisions. I've got some at 9, 10 o'clock there, you can see, for the alternatives directive. Each directive that you see will have its own set of specific provisions. If we don't have lots of banks in the room, this is not so much of a, a good slide to have. But anybody who is a bank and remembers Madoff will know how the regulators completely changed their mind. Just like in the capital markets, they changed their mind after Lehman. In the banking and custodial banking environment, uh, there's been huge regulatory focus on the L word, liability. So what are we talking about? We're talking about fraud. We're talking about failure of uh, local custodians, for example, and the fact that these have to be priced in. And this is not always a message that the end buyer or the asset manager wants to hear. They don't like the idea that things will be more expensive. But if you price in and ensure uh, a greater level of risk, then that must mean a greater cost, a greater tariff, if you like, for the asset managers. And this is something which is a very hot debate at this point, not just under the Alternatives Directive, the uh, Level 1, Article 21, but also the Use It's Five measures as well. So I would just say that, um, that uh, you know, given the fact you're not all banks in the room, if you were, we can go into the slide a little bit longer, and I can decode all the little pieces for you. Um, just suffice to say that in real estate, um, we find that there's... Um, a lot of focus on the alternatives directive as uh, one of the key measures. Uh, we have asset managers and banks who say, well, what, you know, what do we need to do for use at five as well? Will that uh, also change the uh, equation? And the answer is yes, it will. So my guidance to you is to not look at the alternatives directive by itself in terms of one of the key measures that's going to influence the uh, real estate or property markets, but try to look at other directives as well. And I mentioned things like financial transaction tax and also shadow banking. These are going to have um, some unintended effects on price points and, and, and bases of competition in the industry. So um, I'll just end by saying, you know, the end of um, half an hour or just under uh, with time for questions, uh, a few things. So the first thing is, keep somebody in the bridge, look at the big picture, recognize the commonalities between the different measures, uh, design for plural, plurality or complexity, and also uh, start work right away on things that you really know. You can't afford to wait until the, these measures are completely uh, finalized. If you do that, uh, basically you could be out of business. It could be as uh, stark as that. Because uh, the, m the most competitive firms uh, they will already be moving. They will have people who are lobbying, they'll have people who are very close to the process, and they will be moving. They won't be standing still. So that's pretty much what I wanted to say, and I had to stand in, so these aren't actually my slides, <laughs> but I've tried to use them as, uh, as best I could for this morning's session. Thanks very much.